have your Bible, start with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is going to be our starting verse today. This is a verse that um, comes to my mind very, very often. This is a verse that the Lord speaks to me uh, again and again and again throughout my life. And I'm sure I've probably used it as a starting text before just simply because uh, it is such a uh, uh, significant verse in my life uh, as, as I think about it. If you're able to, please stand for the reading of God's Word as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, just one verse, verse 1. Paul writes to the Christians at Ephesus, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, at the time he wrote this, he was in prison. That's why he says that. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which or to which you have been called. I cannot tell you the number of times in my life that I'll be in the midst of doing something maybe that I shouldn't be doing or whatever the case would be and I'll hear God nudge me and say this, these words to me. Russell, are you walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called? And can I be honest with you, a lot of times I have to say, no, I'm not. God has called us to a standard. We're going to talk about that today. And how we might more effectively live to the standard that he's called us to. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, we have to study your word. I pray, God, that as we reflect upon what you say to us this morning through your living word, God, that we would hear your voice and that we would understand the principles and the truths you have for us, Lord, and that we'd apply them to our lives, that we might be better representatives of who you are in this world. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, turn with me back to Corinthians chapter 6. Corinthians chapter 6, where we continue our prolonged series through Paul's writings to Corinth. For those of you keeping score out there, this is message 37 in our series through Paul's letters to Corinth. We have been at it since last Easter, and we will finish around Easter this year. So we're getting closer to the end, but this morning we find ourselves in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now unlike 1 Corinthians, which was a letter of instruction written to the church about particular questions and issues and concerns that Paul had, 2 Corinthians, we've discovered in the first five chapters, is a very different letter than 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians was uh, written in the context of the fact that the church at Corinth had, uh, for a season of time, gone off the rails, if you will. The church had allowed false teachers to rise up amongst the congregation, and they listened to these false teachers who were uh, misrepresenting the biblical truths and the doctrines of God. And above and beyond that, they were uh, asserting that Paul and his associates were unreliable, untrustworthy, and that they were the false teachers. And so the church went through a very difficult season in which they were uh, wandering in the wilderness, if you will. But... As we have learned, the church, by God's grace, repented, made the necessary changes, and even expelled people as necessary and their leadership, uh, and they turned back to God. But in 2 Corinthians, Paul 
is writing to them and he is trying to describe and defend his own character and his own ministry from those in their midst who are slandering him. And as such, we have discovered in this letter so far, and we will continue to do so, that Paul is very candid about the challenges that he faces, the difficulties that he encounters in his travels. He's trying to communicate to them, these are the links that we are going, me and my colleagues, on your behalf and on behalf of the churches everywhere and ultimately on behalf of God. He says, I'm not bragging about these things, but you need to know that the things that are being said about us are not true. And he also talks about in this letter uh, the purpose behind their labor. Why do we do what we do? Because there are those out there who are wolves in sheep's clothing, and the reason they do what they do is so they can uh, promote themselves. So that they can uh, accomplish their own agenda and their own interests. They're not doing it selflessly for the Lord as we aspire to do and as all true Christians should aspire to do. And he also talks about in this letter the motivation that drives them. I'm not motivated by greed. I'm not motivated by desire for fame or, or, or popularity. I'm not, I'm not looking for status. I'm looking to be obedient and to be faithful and to serve God. And he acknowledges and gives thanks to God in this letter for empowering them and strengthening them even in their own weakness. Of all of the letters that Paul writes that we have in the New Testament as books of the Bible, this one is probably the most uh, just open and transparent about this is what my ministry looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is why I do what I do. And this is how I feel about why I do what I do. And he's very, very, just very honest and he pours his heart out in this letter because he is trying to tell them you're be the things you're being told about me are not true. And the things that you're being told about God are not true. In today's sermon, we continue this, this same focus. It's, the, it's kind of the theme of much of this letter. And so today we will continue to read more of Paul's own personal testimony about his efforts to serve God in a worthy manner. Paul was striving to live in a manner worthy of the calling to which he was called. And in addition, this morning we will read some guidance that he gives to the Corinthians themselves for how they can serve God better as his church in Corinth. And of course, as we read these truths, we can take a lot of these principles and apply them to ourselves individually and to our church today. And so I hope God will speak to us through this this morning as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have the outline there, the first point is be pleasing to God. He's been talking about this for the last several chapters. Be pleasing to God. Let's pick up, starting in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul writes, And working together with him, that is, with God, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no cause for offense in anything, so that the ministry will not be discredited, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in endurance, in afflictions, in hardship, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumult, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the loving spirit, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, in the we for the weapons of righteousness, for the right hand and for the left hand, by glory and by dishonor. By evil report, good report, regarded as deceivers, yet true, unknown, yet well known, dying, yet behold, we live, punished, yet we've uh, not been put to death, sorrow, 
as, yet as rejoicing as poor, yet as making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. Those last several verses, just a long list. We'll look at that in a minute. But Paul opened this portion of his letter by saying, and working together with him. That little phrase deserves a little bit of attention before we just read past it. Paul is saying that he and his co-workers, their, his, his fellow missionaries, are working together with the Lord. He is acknowledging that God allows his children, that is those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, God allows them to serve as his hands and feet. Beloved, we as, as believers are called to be the servants of the Lord. But not only are we called to be the servants of the Lord, but we are equipped by the Lord in order to do the things that he has entrusted for us to do. And not only has he entrusted them to us, but Bible says he has prepared them in advance so that we might walk in them. Beloved, we get the privilege and the honor to work alongside God Almighty and to do kingdom work for him and on his behalf as his servants. I go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when God came to Adam before the fall and said, Adam, I've got work for you to do. I want you to tend the garden. I want you to care for the garden. Could God not tend the garden? God could have designed it to where it never even needed to be tended. But he gave Adam the privilege to work on his behalf. And that concept has continued throughout all of time. We should not look at ministry, we should not look at Christian service as drudgery, as, I've got to do this. We should look at it as, I get to do this. God doesn't need me to do it. God can do it himself, but he lets me participate in gospel work. What a blessing. We should never, ever, ever take that for granted. And Paul says, it is those who get to work together with God. I have something to say to you, Corinthians. I urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What does that mean? Not to receive the grace of God in vain. Well, you can interpret it in a variety of different ways, but let's look at what the text says and see if that gives us some context clues as to maybe what this means. In the very next verse, he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you and on the day of salvation I helped you. That is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 49 verse 8. Now when Isaiah wrote those words all the way back here in the Old Testament he was writing them anticipating the day prophesying of a future day in which the children of Israel who would be carried away into uh, captivity by the Babylonians would someday be released and set free. And he was anticipating and looking forward to that day, that acceptable day, when they would be delivered, when they would be saved, when they would be released. But as Paul is using it, he takes that same idea and he uses it in the context of us as Christians. And he uses it in the context of the, the, the church age. And he says, Beloved, 
lost people, those who don't know Jesus Christ, are still in their sin. Lost people are still in bondage. Lost people are still, if you will, chained by the weight of the devil and his demonic forces, and they are unforgiven. They are walking in condemnation. They are walking in darkness. And he says, but at the acceptable time, God heard and God came to help. God came to bring salvation. He's talking now about Jesus who came to deliver repentant sinners from their condemnation. And he says, and when is that? When, when has God heard and when is the time to act upon the grace that God has offered through Jesus Christ? When is the time? And he answers the question. He says, now. Now. Today is the acceptable time. Now is the day of your salvation. Beloved, what he's saying is, Corinthians, please don't ignore or dismiss the saving message of God's grace. Don't put off repenting of your sins and turning to Jesus Christ and being forgiven and being born again and receiving the free gift of grace through Christ. Don't put it off any longer. Do it today. Why? Well, why waste any more of your life walking in darkness when you could be walking in light? And above and beyond all that, not to be morbid, you don't know how long you have left. You might not survive even through the remainder of this day. Even young people. Cars wrecked. Accidents happen. It's tragic. Communities grieve. Families grieve. But it happens. I've met way too many people who said, well, I'm going to get right with Jesus later. There might not be a later, friend. He says the day of salvation is now. Walk in the grace of God now. Accept Jesus now. But it goes beyond just the message of salvation. He doesn't want them to continue walking in their old ways. He wants them to experience the transformational power of God's grace. He wants them to live in the light of God's grace. He doesn't want them just to live in mediocrity. He doesn't want them to be lukewarm Christians. He doesn't want them to live as Christians in name only. He doesn't want their lives to be tasteless. He wants them to be seasoned. He wants them to be pungent with the aroma of God. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Get right Day, now, don't waste another second. Because God has glorious things for you. Don't put them off, don't miss them any longer than you have to. And then after giving this message there in verse 2 to the Corinthians, he turns back to he and his team that are working together with God. And he says, we, we're servants of God. And therefore... We will strive, verse 3, not to give any offense in anything so as not to discredit the ministry, which, translation, disparage the name of God. Because our church is, our ministry is a direct reflection upon the one in whose name we're ministering for. Heaven help us when our church is bringing reproach to the name of God by witnesses around us. When the world looks at the church and they desire God less because of the people of God, that's a problem. He says, help us 
God. We want to live in a way and we want to minister and we want to serve in a way that does not discredit the ministry or disparage the Lord's name into that end. And now we get into this long list. I'll go through it quickly. He says, to that end, we have committed to serve him despite enduring afflictions, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labor, sleeplessness, and hunger. And with every word he wrote there, I'm sure he was referencing specific events in his life. In specific circumstances. Because again, he's very personal with this letter. He's letting them know, this is the stuff we go through. And we're committed to do it. He says, we will speak and we will act in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, guided by and in the Holy Spirit, with genuine and genuine love, but also in truth, and in the power of God. He says, the members of my team and myself are determined to live righteously, whether it brings us glory or dishonor in the eyes of the world, whether it comes with a good report or a bad report. He writes here that he knew the enemies would regard them as deceivers, as liars, but he said, we tell the truth. He says, they're going to say that we are unknown, that we are obscure, that we are inconsequential. But we're not. We're making a difference not because of us, but because of God in us. And we are known to those who God wants us to be known to. He says, they're going to say we're dying, but in Christ we live. They're going to say that we're punished. We are the, you know, we're the, the, the that part of society that, that, you know, deserves to be condemned and rebuked and punished. But he said, but we haven't been executed yet. <laughs> we're still alive and kicking and we're going to keep going. They're going to regard us as sorrowful, as sad, as pathetic. But you know what? We, in, in truth, we rejoice. They're going to say that we're poor. But they don't understand what true poverty is. Because the fact of the matter is, God is using us to make many people rich in things that are beyond earthly trade. He says, they're going to say we have nothing, but in Christ we have everything we need. Simply put, he says, the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people and his workers and his ministers and specifically those who you have been listening to who have been saying uh, uh, things about me and my college to try to get you to uh, somehow disregard us and, and, and think Ill, Ill of us. He says, they're going to say those things. I know they're going to say those things. But listen, we're not going to be discouraged. We're not going to be deterred. By their false claims. But instead we are going to remain fully focused and dedicated. To the work that God has called us to. And to live lives pleasing to the Lord. And you Corinthian, should do likewise. Don't worry what the world thinks about you. Because quite frankly. The world's perspective is so screwed up it doesn't even matter. They don't know what they're saying. The second point this morning is called Be Open to Believers. We'll continue in verse 11. Paul says, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. In like exchange, I speak to you as children, open wide to us also. Paul told the Corinthians that he and his colleagues have been open and honest in word and in heart with them the whole time. Throughout their initial season, when Paul and his his uh, his friends came and, and they started the church and, and everybody was excited and everybody was on board, 
And for 18 months he lived with them there in Corinth. You remember during his second missionary journey and the church started there and every, everybody was excited and on fire for God. And then Paul leaves and these other teachers come in behind him and the church goes astray. Paul says, listen, I, I never lost my love for you. Even when you wandered away, I never lost my love for you. He says, I've always been open and honest with you. I've always told you exactly how I feel. And when you were wandering in sin, I wrote to you in my letter. We've seen it. And we'll see more of it later in this letter. I wrote to you and I told you, frankly, how distraught I was because of your actions. And I told you how sorrowful I was and the level of frustration I felt when you were wandering and astray. And I even called you to repentance. And I rebuked you for the sin that you were living in at that time. And that wasn't easy for me to do. Beloved, I have found in life that when you have a friend or a family member or somebody you love very much, it's, it's oftentimes very hard to call them out when they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. It's a lot easier to call out a stranger than it is to call out somebody you love. It's uncomfortable. It's, it's risky. With a stranger, it's no harm, no foul. They don't like it, I don't care. But with somebody you love and you see every day, and they're walking in sin, and you, you have to tell them. It's not loving just to let it go. You have to tell them. And it's hard. And Paul said, we did that. We did that. Our love for you never faded. We've been open and honest, even when it was uncomfortable. We've been transparent. You know what Proverbs 27, 6 says? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. An enemy will kiss you and say everything's okay. It's fine. You can, you can ignore God on this and, and, and do whatever you want to do. I'm not going to fault you for it. I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. I'm going to kiss you. I'm going to say everything's fine. And you know what that is? That's a kiss of an enemy. And it is deceitful. when somebody calls you out and tells you you're doing something wrong. But if you are doing something wrong and they call you out on it, <coughs> you can know that those wounds have been inflicted out of love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And my prayer is that all of us, all of us, have people in our lives who love us enough to tell us when we're wrong. Tell us when we're out of line. Tell us when we're being stupid. And my prayer is that we would do that for one another. Not being critical or being spirited. But if we see somebody walking away from the Lord, we need, we need to lovingly call them out. On them. Faithful are the ones of a friend. Paul says, listen, even when you guys were wandering away, my fondness for you, my affection for you, and my transparency towards you never faded. I didn't hold back from telling you what you needed to hear. But he says, your affections for me and for us did fade. He said, you weren't restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. You held them back. During that season, you believed the lies that were being told, and your attitudes towards us changed. And our fellowship was broken. They were misled by false teachers. They believed the lies. They blatantly ignored Paul's instructions. They blatantly disregarded uh, the, the words of, of God being uh, uh, relayed to them through 
his servant Paul. And they regarded Paul as unreliable and untrustworthy. They wanted nothing to do with him. But Paul says, now I urge you, now that you have repented, now that by God's grace you have turned back to him, open your hearts to us again as well. He says, I speak to you as children. That doesn't mean he's trying to speak down to them or anything. He's saying, I just want you to understand. Very simply, we love you openly. We want you to love us openly as well. It's a simple exchange. So that our relationship might be mutually edified and built on the love of Christ and renewed fellowship. Beloved, what's the message here? That we as Christians need to be honest and transparent with each other. We are a family. As such, we need to tell each other the truth. Even when it's difficult to do so. The way we do that is in love. Not with the critical spirit. We should share our true feelings when we're hurting. When the actions of our brethren and sisters are causing us to hurt, we need to tell them. And likewise, we need to listen as they tell us. Yep. Scripture says we need to confess our sins to one another. What does that mean? That means we need to talk to each other. We need to communicate. We need to be transparent with each other as, as Christians, as believers, so that we can encourage one another, so that we can pray for one another, so that we can be a mutual support system for one another. We should love unconditionally. We should forgive those who stumble. We should always seek reconciliation and restoration if at all possible. We need to be open to believers. But lastly, we need to be separate from unbelievers. Separate from unbelievers. Verse 14 to the end of the chapter. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. In the King James it says, do not be unequally yoked. You've probably heard that before. With unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawless, lawlessness? Or what fellowship have light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or, or a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, and I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you and I will be like a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Paul is just talking about being open and honest with fellow believers. And to have that like exchange between family of God. But then he turns and says, now in regard to unbelievers you O Corinthians need to separate yourself from them. Draw close with each other as believers, but separate yourself from unbelievers. And to make this point clear, he has several questions right there. I'll just repeat them quickly. He's just emphasizing his point. He says, what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? None. What fellowship does light have with darkness? None. What harmony does Christ have with Belial? Belial is a, a, one of the many Hebrew titles for Satan. None. What does the believer have in common with an unbeliever? None. Nothing. What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? None. He's emphasizing again and again and again the distinction. And when he finishes the last question, he explains that born-again believers are the temple of God. So we fall on that side of the divide. We fall on the temple of God, not on the idols. We fall on the believers, not on the unbelievers. We fall on the righteous, not on the unrighteous. We follow on the light, not the darkness. There is a distinction. There should be a clear delineation. Listen. He is saying, separate yourselves. Do not be bound with unbelievers. 
Well, Christians are called in Scripture to live among unbelievers and in so doing to engage this lost culture with the gospel and with the glorious news of Christ at the same time we are called simultaneously not to be bound to them. Jesus said to his disciples you will live in the world but you are not to be of the world. Jesus taught in one of his parables that the wheat has grown up but tares have grown in amongst the wheat and when the uh, laborer said, well, should we go tear the tears down? He said, no, let them grow together until the harvest. Beloved, in this world, there are saved people and there are lost people, and God, we coexist side by side, and God is waiting till judgment day to sort it out. And so this verse doesn't mean that we are to isolate ourselves from any association or engagement with lost people, no. We are called to proclaim the good news to this lost world. But at the same time, we are not to be bound to unbelievers. So what does that mean, not to be bound to unbelievers? It means that we, as Christians, should not knowingly, intentionally, purposefully, recklessly, foolishly engage ourselves or commit to formal partnerships or contractual agreements or perhaps even the most notable or most talked about covenant relationships like marriage with a lost person. Beloved, I'm not trying to say, nor is Scripture trying to say, that every one of us who is a Christian is is perfect, and and that uh, you know you can only you can only associate and be with perfect people. There's, there's no such thing. And not only is every person perfect, but every relationship between people is in, is imperfect, not perfect, imperfect. I mean, I can tell you firsthand that. Uh, there are flaws in Genesis and Isaac's marriage. There are flaws in Owen and I's relationship. We're not perfect. We, we make mistakes. But don't bind yourself to a person who practices a lifestyle of ungodliness or disbelief. Scripture says don't do that. That's not a wise decision. Whether we're talking about in your personal relationships or in your business relationships. Don't bind yourself to those who live in blatant and in unremorseful, unrepentant sin. Why? Well, he explains it using verses from the Old Testament. These verses here at the end of this chapter come from a collection of verses that are all mashed together. Leviticus 26.12, Exodus 29.45, Isaiah 52.11, Ezekiel 20.41, and Isaiah 43.6. Parts of all of these verses, Paul takes and combines them together. But the bottom line in all of those verses in the Old Testament is Paul was calling his nation Israel to come out of and be distinct from the heathen nations around them. To be pure and separate and set apart from all of the heathen nations that surrounded them, like uh, Moab and, and Ammon and, and Edom and all of these nations around. 
He says, be different, be distinct. Don't, don't bind yourself with these other people. And in the same way, Paul is saying, Christian, don't bind yourself to unbelievers. Why? Because such bindings are dangerous. And you know what they will invariably lead to? Invariably? Compromise and impurity. Very, very rarely. I'm not saying it never happens, but I'm saying very rarely, based on Scripture. Very rarely will a righteous person cause an unrighteous person to become more righteous. Very rarely will a saved person be able, by their witness, to get that unsaved person to rise to that standard. It does happen. But the overwhelming majority of the time, what happens is, the righteous person will begin to compromise. And they will become increasingly more like that lost person. Look at the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. They didn't do what God told them to do. They didn't purge out all of the, uh, the idolaters. And as a result, as generations passed, increasingly they fell into idolatry. Separate yourselves. From unbelievers. So that you might live as I've called you to live. Well, let me close. I'm out of time. So very quickly. How can we, going back to verse 1, not receive the grace of God in vain? How can we walk in the grace of God? Well, first of all, we need to realize the value of His grace. God's grace is all that gets us through the day, beloved. We need to recognize it's an act of His grace even to allow us to participate in His work as we talked about. And we need to commit to serve Him good, bad, no matter come what man. Even if you have to spend your weeks in Oklahoma, you're going to serve Him. Come on, man! And live life that is pleasing to Him. And as we do so, we should try to walk in close fellowship with one another. Because guess what, beloved? We need each other. We're the brothers and sisters uh, uh, brothers and sisters we're the children of God we are members of the body of Christ we are his church we are his chosen bride we are the temple of God well, we are co-laborers of the same harvest comrades of the same army athletes of the same race and sheep of the same pasture we need each other and as such we need to learn to love and support one another in truth rather than constantly tearing each other down and then finally, the other thing we touch on, and I'm done, we should remove ourselves and be distinct from unbelievers. We need to be unbound from them. God has called us to a higher standard. It's a standard of holiness. It's a standard of purity. We can't be pure if we're mulling around in the mud all the time. God has called us to a standard of holiness. The scripture says, Be holy as I am holy. Beloved, I know and you know that in this life we will never make complete holiness. It's a bar that we will never be able to clear. I remember when Coy would do high jump in junior high. And he would go and he'd jump and several rounds would pass and the bar would keep getting higher. And then we'd get to a point that even Coy couldn't clear. He was pretty good. I couldn't clear it way down here. I'm not going to be able to crawl under it. I don't know. But it would get to the point where even Coy couldn't jump over it. But, beloved, as we think about that in the context of holiness, God's called, God set the bar high. And let's be honest, it's a bar that we can't jump over, even on our best day. That's why Jesus has to do it for us. That's why we got to trust in Him for salvation, because we can't earn it ourselves. But here's the point. God says, even though the bar is holiness, and you are not there yet, that does not give you permission to stop trying jumping over the bar. You keep jumping. You keep jumping.
be whole. I can't be whole. Be whole. I can't be whole. Be whole. You keep jumping. God is calling us to strive for that standard even if we know we can never reach it because in our efforts, we will honor God. And in our efforts, we will reach more of the potential that he has called us to. And in our efforts, we will aspire to live worthy of the calling of Christ. And so, I wrote here as I close, we cannot fully enjoy the light of God's grace if we are shaded by umbrellas of sinful relationships and associations. Beloved, it's not God's grace that diminishes it's our shielding of it in our lives through our own sin and through our own unwillingness to be obedient. May we not receive the grace of God. Amen. Father, thank you for today and the opportunity we have, Lord, once again to be in your house. Lord, as Christians, you have called us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, that are open and honest with one another as your family and that are distinct and separate from this lost world, so that they might see a difference in us and might be attracted to you as a result of the witness of your people. We can't do that if we're not distinct and different. We don't offer anything other than what the world offers when we look just exactly like the world looks. Help us to walk in the light of your grace. And Lord, I do pray that if there's any lost person here today who's never trusted you as the Lord and Savior of their life, who's never asked you for forgiveness of their sins and the hope of eternal life, I hope that they would realize that today is the day of salvation. And they would make that decision and repent and surrender to you today. Perhaps even during this invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name.